workers that are working with kids, and uh, we pray, God, uh, that these children would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so uh, bless this time we have in here tonight, and uh, may the name of Jesus be lifted up and glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, I myself, um, there's so much I want to cover, and the more I get into this, the, um, the more I want to cover. Um, so let's go back. We were go one of the things I said was look at Hebrews. I'm sorry, Hosea. I keep saying he Hebrews because I want to go to Hebrews. And uh, but Ho you can go ahead and stick your finger in Hebrews chapter number six, and actually Hosea chapter number nine and ten. Um, one of the verses that we've been using throughout this study of Hosea. And it's going to speed up now that we're getting on the back part of it because it's really judgment. And so I'm not going to be as detailed as I was in the first uh, nine chapters of, of the study. Um, I looked on uh, how many words I've, or how many letters I've typed uh, in my notes, and it's over a quarter million so far in this study. So that's a lot. 57,000 words, quarter million, uh, a quarter million letters. And uh, so you're getting a deeper study in Hosea here than you could ever possibly get anywhere in the world that, that would teach Hosea. You can't get any more. And um, I just believe that if we're going to learn the Bible, let's take our time and learn the Bible. And not only learn it in context, but learn it in application for us today. So when we look at Hosea, who is a prophet, and, and he's speaking to the children of Israel, and he is speaking, uh, God is speaking through him to the children of Israel, God keeps reminding them throughout that I am the God that brought you out of bondage from Egypt. And remember me. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. I keep bringing this up as well as mankind, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, he said that as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so uh, when we look at what's happening in this world today, all the sin that's going on, the sexual sin. Last night I was watching uh, uh, something on TV, and there was a new medication they came out for skin, like psoriasis or something like that. And it showed that uh, this one couple went to the movies and she's got a, uh, like a pop in her hand without a lid. And she got excited, jumped up and splashed. And he's got popcorn, jumped up and splashed. She got that couple, shows another couple. And then it shows an older man laying his head on another man's shoulder. Two homosexuals. We're talking about medication. Now they're, now they're putting all that stuff into commercials like that. I mean, this has nothing to do with a sexual medication. It has nothing to do with, of course, you've seen those with AIDS and, and uh, HIV. And, well, you can have HIV and nobody will know it. Just take this pill and have, live your lifestyle the any old way you want to. We've seen those commercials. But now it's just a regular commercial, like if you have psoriasis or something, they show different people, and what do they show? They show a man laying his head on another man's shoulder. I thought, you got to be kidding me. We have to do this. We have to include everybody, even the 2% of that 
now I guess it's probably growing uh, to 5% or so of the population, but it's not 20 or 30 percent, don't think that for a minute. Um, so mankind has the same sin nature that mankind's always had. So when I say man, the same yesterday, today, forever, when we look at uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and he sent three angels, uh, one was the angel of the Lord, which was a theophany, it was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, because he accepted worship from Abraham. Angels aren't allowed to accept worship. And the other two angels went on to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The same sins that are going, were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah are going on in this world today. And so when we look back at mankind, mankind has always been the same. The only difference now is that we drive cars and we have computers. And we can go in space. And we got man... As Daniel says, uh, time uh, uh, when travel shall increase. And uh, now we got man traveling 17,000 miles above our heads and uh, out in space. Knowledge shall increase, travel to and fro. So knowledge has increased. Now the, the and knowledge doubles. Who knows what's scary now is this AI, this, uh, which I really didn't hear much about AI before. And, uh, you know, I was watching a, a thing about the CIA and uh, black ops and, and this guy that's a former uh, CIA agent. Some of you have probably seen him on the news. And he had this program going on. He said, this is what they're worried about is uh, for assassinations is uh, they're not worried about lone gunmen anymore. They're worried about AI. They're worried about these uh, drones that are loaded with enough to put a, a charge into your head and like the drone has your face and if you two were standing together to pick out your face identify you and kill you and but so where the president of the United States goes now they've got these uh, anti-drones uh, weapons that will uh, send different sound waves and things and mess them up where those drones will fall out of the sky. Isn't that something? I mean, there's actually a movie out about that uh, that killed all the Secret Service agents and, and uh, uh, White House has fallen or in that one it's angels fallen and um, I thought, yeah, right. It's, yeah, that's the way it is today. Um I'd say all that to say this. I, I think we might, those of us that are older, we may even see the Lord's return. I think we're closer and closer. And I think for those of you that are younger, you know, the generation behind us, I think you're definitely going to see the Lord's return. Get ready. I don't see how. If I, knowing what I've seen, and George, what you've seen, and Mary, what you've seen, and Pat, what you've seen, and Jackie, what we've seen in the past 30 years transpire from 30 years ago, what we've seen happen, go back 40 years, 50 years ago, what we've seen in the past 50 years, there's no way. I can believe that uh, I that I believe that the, that the Lord's not coming back. And here we see in Hosea now. Uh, last week, I had um, mentioned to you. I wanted you to look at Hebrews uh, chapter number six. Um, the reason why I wanted to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to go backwards. Let's take a look at Hosea chapter number 9. Let's go back. And I want you to, as I told you before, from verse number 10 to verse number 17, there's not much to say other than the children of Israel are about to receive judgment for what they've done. But I want to point something out to you. I'm going to go a little deeper. I'm going to 
I'm going to turn the screws a little bit. I want to go down to verse number 15. Actually, look at verse number 14. It says, Give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Verse 15 says, All their wickedness is in where? Gilgal. I want you to think about that, Gilgal. Does anybody know where Gilgal is? Anybody at all? It's right across the Jordan. Okay? No, I'm in, I'm in Hosea 9. I never mentioned Hebrews 11. No, Hosea 9. Hosea 9. Hosea 9, 15. Look at this. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Verse 16, Ephraim. Ephraim is the northern kingdom, is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, uh, uh, though, thou, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among nations. God's judgments comes not only through famine and the land, but what we're reading here through the womb. After the Assyrian captivity, the, the ten tribes of Israel would remain lost, and unlike the southern kingdom, they'd never return to rebuild the nation, but would be like a mixed breed throughout the land. Most Jewish people today cannot tell you what tribe they actually came from. Uh, but the interesting thing about Gilgal is, is here God in Hosea says, all their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them, for there the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine houses, I will love them no more, and all their princes are revolters. Wouldn't we all agree that God's ticked off? Wouldn't we all agree that there at Gilgal, God says that's it? All right, so we got that straightened out. That's important. Because if we really look at Gilgal, Gilgal was a special place to remember. It was a place located east of Jerusalem. It was west of, I'm sorry, east of the Jordan, in Jerusalem. And it was there where former Egyptian slaves, the Jews, found rest and food after their captivity. It was the first time that they ate fruit. Now it's interesting, when we look at verse number 10, I told you to look at verse number 10, of, uh, of Hosea, verse number 10, is, it starts out, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. So if you remember what I preached on Sunday, as a matter of fact, I preached that Jesus was the vine, and we are the branches. And we are to produce fruit. By their fruit you shall know them. Amen? So the interesting thing is here, when I read this about Gilgal, is it was a special place, is that it was also the place where Joshua made it across the Jordan, and if you remember, each one of the tribes carried a stone and the 12 stones that they built, he built an altar there. This was a special place for God. This was a special place that right after the, so if we look at the start of the Jews after they come out of Egyptian bondage, where do they go? They stop at Gilgal is the first place they eat fruit. They stop at Gilgal and they make themselves right. They stop at Gilgal and they are all circumcised. They stop at Gilgal and they 
build an altar for God. They stop at Gilgal, and they're praising God, and they stop at Gilgal now, and God says, I'm mad at you. Gilgal is a special place. But when we look at it in verse number, chapter number 9, verse number 15, we kind of... Yes, do you have a question? Pardon me? No, no. Gilgal is different. Nope. It's a different place. Turn your Bibles over to Joshua real quick, chapter number 4. Let's take a little bit. I, I want to just get down a little deeper on this thing. Joshua chapter number 4. And in verse number 18, it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up on the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up to dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and flowed over the banks as they did before. And the people come up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in where? Gilgal. In the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones, verse 20, and those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Then sh uh, ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did in the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that it is mighty that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. It was Gilgal that the children of Israel decided that following God wasn't sufficient and that they desired to be like other countries, that they wanted to have king instead of following God. In 1 Samuel chapter number 11, verses 14 and 15, you don't have to turn there, let me just read this to you. Then said Samuel to the people, come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So Gilgal is not only where they crossed over the Jordan. Gilgal is not only the place where they circumcised themselves, committed themselves to God and identified with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the, um, the covenant of God. But Gilgal was also the place where God dried up the waters. One of the greatest miracles in the Bible right there next to the Red Sea where the, they, they crossed the Jordan and they made the altar of stones and now Gilgal is the place hundreds of years later now we're in 700 uh, BC and uh, now we're at the place in 1500 BC was Moses and Joshua so some 800 seven eight hundred years later here this place is is so special to God it's where everything gets started everything gets going and you know what it's where everything ends I look at America. America was started, a country started on God. Now look at America. It's a godless country. We sent missionaries all over the world. And, you know, even, even 25 years ago, um, you never heard of sending missionaries to America. Now, America is a mission field. I mean, a lot of places in, 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 in Hawaii is a mission field. You think, oh, it's the tropics, it's beautiful. It's also built full of demonic stuff. How about New Orleans? You wouldn't catch me there. You couldn't pay me enough to go to New Orleans. It's 
wicked. It's demonic. It's uh, voodoo and all that stuff. Um, Las Vegas, they took a desert and made a false oasis out of it. And you know what? People would fly off to Las Vegas and they think, oh, we're going to see the shows and the food and, the, and all this. And they, they suck your money dry when you walk in. And the devil's laughing as you walk out. Let me tell you something. I went to Las Vegas one time. I was 19 years old. And I'll never forget when I walked in, I, I walked into a casino. And right now, I don't go to casinos because you know why? I like it, so I stay away. I don't walk into the Detroit casinos. I wouldn't walk into them. Uh, I walked into the one at Greek, Greek Town because I was on jury duty at lunchtime. I just wanted to see how they changed Greek Town. And I walked in, it was full of cigarette smoke, and I walked right out. Um, then somehow they'll let you do whatever just to keep you there. You want to suck on cigarettes, cigar, whatever you got to do, I guess they let you do it. Uh, drink alcohol and get, especially drink alcohol, get drunk. You know. And by the way, you don't gamble with money, you gamble with chips. That's not money, it's just different colors. You lose everything. Oh, by the way, if you need money, we can hit your credit card, we can uh, do, you know, ATM machines everywhere. They built that. Right in the middle of the desert, there was a gangster that looked around and uh, Bugsy Siegel, and he said, this is it. You know, I'm going to build someplace, uh, a, a hotel with a casino right here in, in this desert. Of course, he got a bullet in the head for it because he stole the gangster's money and all that stuff. They didn't like that. Um, all those gangsters are gone now. There's no such thing as a mafia anymore. What's that? Yeah, sure they are. So anyway, getting back to Gilgal, is a Gilgal that also, like I said, that they decided, they, they pulled Samuel aside, they said, we want a king. So many blessings occurred in the, in the eyes of the people of Israel at Gilgal. It was Gilgal where all of Israel were, <coughs> where the ark rested, they, they took the ark, the Ark of the Covenant, they rested it. Um, and their sins and rebellion with it, supposedly. Um, but you know one thing about sin is wherever there's sin, you also see God's mercy. And God always gave his mercy. And he even does it today. He says to us, that when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we're saved. But every one of us slip up in sin. If we don't sin, if we don't have sin, the Bible says we're lying. 1 John chapter number 1 says we're a liar. We make him to be a liar. But it also says that in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, I had, uh, there was a person uh, that used to go to this church years ago, and, and we had a problem with this. And, and, and the problem was is that he, he, he didn't believe in repentance. He thought that repentance was uh, something that we did, that we, we worked for our salvation through repentance. I said, no, repentance is a result thereof. In other words, when you are saved, when you're a born-again child of God, when you're heaven-bound and you're saved and you know Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, what's going to happen is when the Holy Spirit of God moves inside of you, you're not going to want to be the same person you've always been. Your want to is going to change. The problem with the children of Israel, a lot of the children of Israel, is that they, they realized they were producing fruit and they were building condominiums and all that stuff, apartments and buildings and all that in Israel. And they're thinking, okay, we're doing this and our, everything was already built there. We're just adding to it and we're, we're doing this and we're doing that and we're responsible for this and we're responsible for that. Ooh, look at us and all that. But what they didn't realize, it was God behind all of it. It's the same thing in America today. You look at America today. And you, how can we be such a fruitful nation? How can we be so blessed and and, and have all the things that we have in America, it's really simple. This country was started on God. 
It was, anybody tells you any different, they don't know the history of this country. And by the way, the history of our country is a smaller history than most countries in the world. Our country is a baby country. It's only 250 years old. Go over there to the United Kingdom and go over there to um, you know see castles. And I was in Rome. I saw. I stood in the Colosseum that's a couple thousand years old, where they slaughtered Christians. Different world leaders have taken over. Whether it was Babylon, um, I was looking at some of my maps today and. Um, and so you had the, the Persia was Iraq, Babylon was uh, part of Saudi Arabia, Arabian Desert. Um, Babylon had such a huge wall, there's no way that they could ever be taken over. There's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody with a better mousetrap. So the Medes and the Persians got together and they put a whooping on Nebuchadnezzar. Then all of a sudden, there was the Greeks. Alexander the Great comes along with all of his faults of being a young drunk, but he had speed. With his speed, he ended up becoming the world power leader, the world leader. Matter of fact, that's who Hitler looked up to. And that's why Hitler made the Luftwaffe, because he looked at Alexander the Great, and he studied history of what, what world leader did what. And he saw the Alexander the Great won over a lot of countries because he was fast. And so they come up with the Luftwaffe, the Air, Air Force. The German Air Force almost won World War II. End of that history, no. But In Joshua chapter 5, we see in verses 8 through 10, and it came to pass that when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from, from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and, and kept the Passover on the fourth day of the month at even the plains of Jericho. So I say all that to say this, is that nothing ever snuck up on God. He has a purpose for everything. He has a purpose for every place. And we have to be careful that we never put our desires before the will of God. I've talked to people, I've talked to men um, that have put in their heads many times I've seen men that's left this, been a part of this ministry and also other ministries that said well this is what this is what I believe God wants me to do and they just jump at it because they see an opportunity and a lot of times I don't mean to sound like Debbie Downer or uh, I should say Darren Downer nowadays. People say, oh, there he goes. He's uh, one of those. Now, um, but it's great you got ambition. It's great that you think you're thinking of serving God in a certain way or something. But is that God's will? If it's not, because if it's not God's will, it's not going to work. One thing that my wife and I, we, we started this church 16 years ago next month. And, um, and so I wanted to make sure that we were in the will of God. God, if this is not what you want us to do, shut the door. Shut the door. I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll stay an associate pastor where I'm at, you know, and he kept opening the doors, opening the doors. It's just like I never wanted to be a pastor. I, I wanted to be an evangelist. 
to be honest with you, that was my desire. My desire was to be an evangelist and even have a, a motor home. Drive around, go preach on the weekends, you know, come back home. That was my desire, but that was not the will of God. We'd all be good, we'd all be better off if every one of us decided to seek the will of God in our life. And to do that, there's a couple things that got to happen. One is we got to empty ourselves. It's pretty hard to do, especially nowadays, because we're so smart. Oh, we're so smart. We're smarter than any generation. I mean, we all walk around with computers in our hands. I'll bet you, let's see. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I would guarantee you I could count up 15 computers in this sanctuary right now. We've got a small crowd. 15 computers. We're too smart for ourselves. You can even look up biblical knowledge by just pressing a button on your phone and saying, go ahead and say, where is Gilgal in the ancient times or something, and it'll pop right up and show you where Gilgal is. Made, us, made some of us lazy. But getting back to what I'm trying to get to, men, mankind is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And mankind always is smarter than God. In their head. Turn over to Romans chapter 12, a very familiar scripture that I've read a million times in this, in this uh, church. Romans chapter 12. Matter of fact, I think, uh, I think um, one of the guys preached on it, uh, mentioned it on, on Sunday night, either this last Sunday night or night four, Sunday night four. But in Romans chapter number 12, Paul says, I beseech you, in other words, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It was reasonable for the Jewish people to do that after they come out of 430 years of bondage. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There it is, the will of God. So in other words, we've got to get rid of our desires, what we think we want to do. Well, God, God would love it if I did this. Is it the will of God? Is it the will of God? Have, you, have, have whatever you're doing in your life Whatever big decisions you're making in your life, whatever, whatever's going on in your life, have you prayed about it first? Or are you just assuming that you're in, this is the will of God, whatever you're doing? I don't know about you, but I want to know that I'm in the will of God. Now, now you know what? To be honest with you, I, I got to let you in on a little secret. Sometimes you're not going to know you're in the will of God. Even though it looks like doors have opened, you're in the will. It seems like everything's going okay. And, you know, this might be the will of God. But the question is, have you emptied yourself? Have you truly emptied yourself and got on your knees and got alone with God and said, God, whatever you know, everybody's situation is different. Everybody's life is different. Everybody's career is different. Everybody's direction's different. All that stuff. Okay, but. One thing is the same, is that we all have the same type of nature as that old sin nature, and we need to, we need to address it and confess it 
and admit it. And the problem with the children of Israel is they just never did. Now, to give them a little bit of leeway here, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And when we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit. That's uh, kind of a, a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Because when you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit inside you, every person I've baptized up there, before I dunk them, I ask two questions. Number one, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? What's the other question, Scott? What's the other question, Scott? Are you listening? You bapt I let you baptize your grandson. You asked him two questions. Did you forget them? Excuse me, Carrie, could you turn around and tell Brother Scott what the other question is? Is it your desire to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that right, Alex? Did I baptize you? Oh, well, Scott baptized you? Did he ask you that question? And what did you say? So you said before God and everybody, it's your desire to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Carrie, did I baptize you? Did I ask you that question? Dean, did I ask you that question? And you both said yes. I'm the only pastor I know that does ask that question. You know why? It needs to be answered. And in the future, when people aren't following God, I'm going to say, remember what you said in front of everybody? I'll remind them. Because some people may forget that question. <clears throat> but, I want to tell you something. Baptism, when I, when I was baptized, that was a turning point in my life and my wife's life. We both were baptized together. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's when I decided no more alcohol in my life. My life changed. I know that it's, it's Jesus that saves us. But I want to tell you something. When you get baptized, it's a special day. Because that's when you're standing before God and mankind and you're saying, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I even get a whiff that somebody's not serious about it, I won't dunk them. I had one, one young lady that claimed she was saved and went off and did some things and didn't want to be baptized. I said, nope, not now. She's mad and her family got mad and she stopped coming to church for, oh, four, five, six months. I'd given her a nice $50, about 50 bucks back then, Bible, and uh, for graduation. And I was about this close because she just left it behind. And so, it was sitting, so I grabbed it, goes into my office, and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to cut that first page right out. And I'm going to give this to a bi this Bible to a young person that doesn't have a Bible, that wants a Bible. And then that person came back, started coming to church, and after about five or six weeks, came up to me and said, Pastor, can I have my Bible back? She knew I had the Bible. I said, Okay. Then after a while, she asked if she could be baptized. I was still a little leery, but I went ahead and I baptized her. She did not become a follower of the Lord. But is that my responsibility? I just preached the word 
do the best I can. And I try to tell people, listen, you can be blessed. God knows the difference. Now, back to, so when we look at Romans chapter 12, real quick, that second verse, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Again, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's if we are followers, then we ought to desire the will of God in our life. It doesn't matter if you're rich, you're poor, you're black, you're white, you're yellow, you're red, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, it doesn't matter what your background is. You're European, you're South American, you're uh, whatever. I was in my, I was in my uh, office tonight, and I was sitting on a stool in my office. You know what I was doing? I was looking for different countries on the globe. You know what I realized? There's a lot of countries. I was looking at some are coming up from Venezuela and, and the track they got to make to come up and all that stuff. That's quite a trip. But as I look at this and I think about mankind, I think about desire and I think about all that stuff, and I think about God's mercy and why, how God wants to forgive us and all that stuff. And in the New Testament, we see First John, Paul writes that last, or not Paul, but John writes that last letter to the church of Ephesus. And, and that first chapter really sounds it out. It, it really spells it out. And in verse number 10 of that, after verse 9, when it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all righteous, unrighteousness. In verse number 10, he says this, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So we've all sinned, every one of us. So we've got to empty ourselves. We've got to be a vessel that empties ourselves. We've also got to be a vessel that cleans ourselves, too. We have to be a clean vessel. We can't be a dirty vessel. We can't be a vessel that... Um, we can't be um, showing up at church on Sunday... And we're in the bar on Saturday. We got to be a clean vessel. And if not, if we continue to go down the same old path and and we mock God like the children of Israel were mocking God with other idols, we'll end up being a broken vessel. God will get our attention. I was talking to your daughter today. And uh, I told her, I said, because I'll be honest with you, when I first heard about her condition, I, was, I thought I thought she was going to have cancer, to be honest with you. I thought, because I saw her coloring before. It was jaundice. I talked to the doctor and stuff, and um, looks like she's good. She's off the ventilator. The other day we went and saw her, and She's deaf. She can't hear anything. Cheryl was across the other side of the bed, and I was over here. And I said, uh, I prayed, and I said, Lord, I know she's deaf. But she doesn't have her hearing aids in. Um, I said, would you allow us to be able to communicate with her? Immediately, her eyes opened up. <laughs> kind of funny. It, it happened right at that time. You know, and then a big smile come on her face. And I said, well, that's kind of tough that she's on a ventilator, and she's conscious. Usually they put you under because, well, they had her, I think, to where she could move her arms, but not right there. They put me on a ventilator. I took those th tubes out. I helped them. They had to put me a little deeper under. And today we went and saw her. We told her we'll be back on Wednesday and we'll, we'll see you. And today we went and saw her. And she didn't have the ventilator on. And her color is good. And I talked to what I believe was a doctor, and, and it sounds like that that thyroid was affecting her. I said, you know, she was jaundiced months ago. Swollen and jaundiced. And he said, yeah, he said, that th thyroid will affect the different organs. You know? 
And I say this to say that I told her, I said, now you need to get up and walk. And of course, my wife is writing stuff down, too. She can read my lips. She can read lips. She's deaf, but she can read lips. And she got it. God has given her an opportunity. Now she's got to get up and work at it. And you know what? God will give all of us an opportunity. He will. We got a desire to be in God's will. And I gave her, the other day I gave her a bunch of scriptures while we were there. My wife would show them to her on the phone so she could read them. She couldn't see, so my wife gave her her reading glasses. Then we showed up today, and I gave her more different scriptures. And a lot of them had to do with going to church, because she hasn't been to church in a while. It's time to get back in the will of God. We are all going to be laying like that one day on a bed, where the pastor comes in and might say some ditty of a prayer. I'm going to tell you, if I come into your bed, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. That's the kind of pastor I am. Some of you haven't seen me at the bedside, but I'll also be there when you take your last breath. I've been to a lot of places at that point, too. We're all headed that to, in that direction. The key is the will of God. Now, let me jump ahead here to Hosea, chapter number 10. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. And verse number 2 says, Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty? He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. Verse 3 says, For now they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? When we look back in chapter number 9, verse number 10, it says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers in the first stripe of the fig tree at her first time. Whenever we see fig trees and things like that, it speaks of, of Israel. But they went to uh, Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. You know what? Remember when Elijah went in 1 Kings chapter number 18 and he went he went back have a seat Douglas. He went back and he had went up against the prophets of Baal him against 430 prophets of Baal and what he did was he said you go ahead you, there's two bullocks we'll cut them up and and uh, you go ahead, whoever's God will set them on fire. That's the true God. So they're cutting themselves. They're jumping up and down and cutting themselves and doing all kinds of things. And, and Elijah's really mocking them and saying, well, maybe, you're, maybe your God is out uh, pursuing. In other words, going to the bathroom. Uh, you know, he's, he's just making jokes at them and cracking at them and stuff like that. And then finally what he does is he says, go ahead and dump uh, all these barrels of water. He said, do it again, do it again. And there was a drought. What does he do? He calls upon the fire of God, and God sends down the fire, and the fire licks up the water, burns up the offerings of the bullocks. And now all of a sudden those 7,000 silent saints that had been worshiping Baal go back to Hosea chapter number 10, verse number 2. Look at that. Their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. Why is it divided? Because they were not only, they, had, they knew that God was God, but for convenience sake, for convenience sake, they had worshipped false gods. For convenience sake, we might have to just um, alter our walk for where we work. What we do for a living. 
Hey, if I hang with the guys, I got to talk like the guys. Hey, if you hang with the guys, maybe if you talk like a Christian and you take the foul language out because um, blessings and cursings ought not to come out of the same mouth, maybe some people will see you as an example and one day come up to you and say, would you pray for me because you got a connection with God. I had one time a general manager pull me aside in the business uh, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, whatever it was. And he is six foot three, 280 pounds. And he came into my office after everybody was gone and cried like a baby over something he had done. There's just no way he could ever be forgiven for it. I said, have you asked for forgiveness? Oh, I've asked God to forgive me and God forgive me. I said, then he has. I said, that's the devil keeps bringing it up to you. Cried like a baby. Do you know what he did? He sought out the man of God. Oh, wait a minute. I worked in the business world. Oh, you can be a man of God in the business world. You can be a man of God on the line. You can be a man of God... Whatever you do. It takes a real man to stand for something. Anybody can fall for anything. Anybody can be a follower, but to be a leader it takes something special. All these people here were followers. 7,000 silent saints standing there while 430 false prophets of Baal were brought in by wicked Jezebel. And she ended up becoming dog food. Let me tell you something. There's no good way out when you don't follow God. We have the whole story now. The Lord Jesus Christ, he came. Why? Because sin came into this world and death by sin. So all of sin come show the glory of God, every one of us. And so there's, there, the, all of us have a sin debt. And we all have a, you know, I went and saw that movie about Israel a couple weeks ago, and I, I met up with a man that was Catholic afterwards, and he knew the Lord as his Savior, but he had a couple things messed up. He said, well, I kind of still believe that purgatory, there is a purgatory for some people. I said, really? Well, um, what happens if nobody shows up to pray you into heaven? What happens if there's a big snow that day? That's what would happen to me. The Bible says, absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Like that. The Bible says that the rich man died and opened up his eyes in hell. The Bible also says that Lazarus was carried by the angels into heaven, into paradise, Abraham's bosom. I believe it. I believe this Bible's true. This has been preserved for all these centuries. It's true. You can't prove it wrong. I'll give anybody $10,000 if they can show me where this Bible's wrong. Can't do it. That goes for you folks on the Internet. Can't do it. You have to pay anybody. That's pretty bold, isn't it, Miss Jackie? That's how much I believe that Bible. I have one guy I said that to in a trailer park knocking on doors. I told him, I said, I'll give you $1,000 for every mistake you show me in the Bible. He come up with about a list of about 18. Come knocking on the door at church. I said, sorry, you're wrong, wrong, wrong here, wrong here, wrong here, wrong here. He went away so discouraged. And not a dime richer. did hear the word okay I'm going to leave it there it's 8 o'clock um, and I'll save what I was going to get into um, in Hebrews chapter number 6 so Connie gets here next week because she's got a bunch of questions for me about it because nobody there's a lot of um, commentators that have it wrong did anybody, did you guys, anybody look it up? Yeah.
you guys look it up? What did you come up with out of it? What was your understanding of it? All right, go ahead and cut the recording off.